slide later. And I think we are all ready to go. Are you ready? Ready. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, today, Olivia and I are going to talk a little about um, citizen science. And to start, even though you can no longer, am I sharing my screen? Uh, you were for a minute. And it disappeared. I think it went away. Is it back? Uh, not yet. Hmm. Well, let me introduce myself while I am trying to figure out how to make this work. Um, we actually went over this twice, so we know it's working, and now it's not going to because we're live. Um, my name is Katie Palm, and I am the director at the Catskills Visitor Center. And um, Olivia is my colleague. Hi, everyone. My name is Olivia Bernard. I'm one of the visitor experience coordinators at the Catskills Visitor Center in Mount Temper. And we wanted to do a program today about citizen science because we know that many of us have time on our hands and would like to do something besides think about work or think about bills. And so we put together um, a presentation for you today. And I'm gonna try once again to show you my slideshow and hopefully it'll work this time. All right, did it come through this time? Yep, I can see it now. All right, great. So it seems to not want to work in presentation mode, so forgive me for showing the whole program. But for the program today, what we would like to do is talk a little about what is citizen science, um, share with you some of the different apps that are available for citizen science, um, and that'll be broken down into those um, websites and applications that help you ID different types of um, animals, flora and fauna. Um, we will look at some um, applications that you can use to actually record data and to help scientists. And then we will give you some um, places where you can go to find some really fun citizen science projects that you can join. And all of these resources that we will talk about today and many more um, we have put together um, in a Google Doc and we will make sure to share, make sure to put that on our website um, either this afternoon or tomorrow, probably tomorrow, um, so that you can go to our website and then look at the resources and um, hopefully find a fun project that you want to get involved with. So to start, um, what is a citizen science? Uh, or what, yeah, what is citizen science? And so citizen science is a way for the common person to help scientists with their research and their studies. Um, there are all sorts of citizen science projects out there. You can help with, um, oh, following the migrations of different birds. You can um, help make sure that our frogs and salamanders cross the roads safely during the breeding season. Um, you can go out and test water to make sure water quality is acceptable throughout the rivers and the water bodies throughout the United States. Um, if you think about it, you can probably find some way to get involved through citizen science. Anything you want to add to that, Olivia? Uh, definitely just uh, to double up on what you were saying, you can monitor, you know, um, the breeding patterns of birds, uh, the, the different phenophases of plants and trees as they progress throughout the season. Um, it's just a, a really fun way to, to get involved. And um, if I could liken it to anything, I would say it's, if you're just getting started with citizen science, it's almost like an outdoor scavenger hunt, um, like geocaching in a way. Um, but uh, just, um, there are lots, lots more that you can, there's lots more that you can do with it. So why is citizen science important? Uh, so um, I think this might be a question that on some people's minds, uh, I, citizen science has lots of different values. Um, so one really, really Im uh, important thing about citizen science is that it kind of increases our all like all of our general awareness and knowledge um, of science and of species 
Um, and it also really broadens the, the subject for all people, regardless of their skill level. Um, it can be really fun for kids and adults. Um, beyond that, um, citizen science uh, also makes it possible for paid scientists to look at a really wide breadth of data uh, across many different locations and many different times of year. So it, it really um, encompasses a lot more than what paid scientists are actually able to do themselves. Uh, so it gives them a lot more information. Um, and then uh, thirdly, uh, scientists are able to see these changes um, through citizen science apps. And then as a result, they're able to really uh, hone in on what changes are occurring in our climate. Um, it tells them a lot about climate patterns and changes. Um, if, for example, certain trees are reported to be blooming earlier in the year consistently, then that tells them a lot um, about weather patterns. So just to give you a little idea of the different projects that are out there, um, we will talk about a couple of these today, but not all of them. Um, there are so many different citizen science projects out there. Um, and uh, like I said before, you can find something on just about anything that interests you. Um, it's amazing. So I think we should dive right in. Let me change the screen. Yeah, you really can find something for every, every topic. I found something today that's all about studying clouds. Um, and that's uh, uh, it's a fun way to learn about weather patterns. <laughs> So did you want to start, Olivia, with um, the, some of the helpful ID programs that are out there? Yeah, um, so the first ones, uh, the first apps or websites that we wanted to go over um, have to do specifically with uh, identification, help you ide uh, identify a species. Um, iNaturalist is the first one uh, that we wanted to talk about, and that one actually is a little bit of both. So it can help you to identify species um, in your neighborhood, in your backyard, uh, but it can also um, record your data uh, for citizen science projects and research. Um, so that one is a, uh, an initiative with the California Academy of Sciences and the National Geographic Society. Um, I'm going to hop on uh, screen share to show you guys a little bit of what iNaturalist is like. And if you guys have questions, please feel free to, to put them in the box. Um, it will uh, address them either during the presentation or toward the end. Um, all right, so I think I got this to work. Great, all right. Um, so uh, let me start with the home page. Uh, so this is iNaturalist. It has me logged in right now. Um, so this is what my homepage looks like. Um, but uh, you can start. Um, there's lots of different tabs to explore. Uh, one thing I like to do is going into the, um, the observations tab. Uh, and then you can either search by location or by species. Um, so I put in Mount Tremper, New York. Uh, to see what people are reporting right around the visitor center. So the visitor center is um, just before, just uh, east of Mount Tremper, right around here. Um, you can click to see what other people are reporting. Um, yesterday, I didn't know specifically what kind of a species, uh, what, what species this plant was. So on the app, what I did was I took a picture of it. And all I wrote initially was mint family, um, because I knew that um, mints have a square stem. Uh, it's this really pretty purple and pink flower. Uh, and just in the last 12 hours since I posted it, um, someone uh, commented and was able to correctly identify it as red dead nettle. Uh, so it's still part of the mint family, but more specifically the species name. Um, so iNaturalist is this community of people who 
are posting and checking people's uh, identification and um, it does a really good job of, uh, of tapping into the community to find out what what plants are in your neighborhood just by taking a picture of it and uh, so you can do that with any picture uh, with any picture you have of a plant or a species and um, I think the next one that we were going to go over um, is another IDing app called Audubon. Um, so for this, I'm going to switch uh, to um, a phone share. Let's see. Uh, so this is the Audubon app. Um, I really recommend this app. Uh, for doing bird identification. Um, it allows you actually to download a whole database of bird species um, before, uh, so if you don't have um, Wi-Fi or internet, for example, you have everything already saved in the app. Um, and uh, it allows you to, um, to kind of vet what species you might be looking at. Uh, so if you have an inkling of what you think it might be, um, you can click on it. And then you can go through the characteristics uh, to figure out if what you're looking at is that species. Um, so it gives you a description, size, shape of the bird, um, and then it gives you a few different variations of what calls and songs you might hear from it. Uh, so it gives you a lot of, um, a lot of information right on this, this free app. Uh, it gives you range, migration, conservation status, habitat. Habitat is always really important when you're trying to identify birds, making a note of what habitat you're in. Um, so this is a great resource for trying to figure out what species um, you're looking at if you're out in the field. Uh, another app that I wanted to show you guys is called PlantNet. Um, and that also allows you to take pictures of plants um, and then you post it online and other citizen scientists uh, help to identify um, species for you. Uh, field guides of course are great ID resources if you um, if you have field guide uh, books with you. Um, uh, Sibley and uh, Peterson are great uh, resources for bird plant guides, tree guides. Uh, they do a really really great job. Um, the last one that I was going to show you guys, uh, I'm going to go off of um, phone share and back onto desktop. And that's the New York Phenology Project. So this is an app or a website rather um, that is a little more specific to New York. Um, and I really like how they have a section of their website with um, all the different phenophases of trees and plants and forbs. Um, so you can click on something like red maple, for example, and it'll pull up a PDF with all of the different um, cycles or stages of the tree. So you can see breaking leaf buds, you can see um, as the leaf size gets larger what it might look like. Um, flowers and flower buds, leaves, colored leaves as it goes into the fall, um, what the fruits look like. Uh, so it really gives you a great um, amount of information if you're trying to identify a plant, like especially early on in the season. Um, and I think, uh, Katie, were you going to say something about New York Phenology Project? Uh, sure. Do you mind if I switch over to control the screen? Not at all. Thanks. So while I'm getting my screen set up, let me um, let me just say that we decided to. I guess I can't do two things at once. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we wanted to share some of these identification um, websites first because we know some people get a little nervous hearing about citizen science because they think they need to be experts on what it is and that's not true at all. Um, there are all of these helpful websites out there that will help you, you know, determine what bird it is by the bird call 
um, what tree it is by going through the pictures. Um, so if you are thinking about diving into citizen science, know that there are all these resources out there to help you um, if you decide to do something that requires identification. Um, and then when it comes to the New York Phenology Project, as Olivia showed you, there are wonderful resources on the website, um, but there is also multiple ways to get involved with this project. So you can become an observer at home where you sign up, you pick out certain plants that you're interested in, you go outside and track them during the seasons. When does the first bud appear? When does the first flower appear? Um, when does the first seed appear? And you track those different things and then you put your information into their website so that they have more data. Um, and that, that is a great way for them, for scientists to help figure out whether climate change is affecting our plants. Because if they find that things are budding or flowering sooner every year, then um, we know that there is climate change going on and we have data to prove it. Um, if you are interested in doing that at home, you can sign up to monitor at different sites across New York State. And um, staff at the Catskill Center or Catskill Visitor Center is very excited because we're working with one of our board members and we're working with um, staff to create a phenology trail at the Catskill Visitor Center. Unfortunately, with the state of the world right now, um, it's on pause. We're not sure when it will be installed, but once it's installed, we'll make sure people know. And if this is a project that interests you, you'll actually be able to come to our site, um, walk through, observe specific plants that we have um, selected, and help us take the data on those plants so that we can add to the scientist's um, data notebook of information. Um, and so, Ah, can I move this? Yes, I can, good. And so if you decide that you're interested in this specific project, you go to the New York Phenology website, you sign up and you use the app Nature's Notebook. And so this is Nature's Notebook. Um, I went in yesterday and decided that I wanted to monitor from home and I was going to monitor two specific plants in my yard. And so I made the, um, hello, there you go. And so I set up, I made a login, just about everything you do with citizen science, you do have to create a login. Um, and I set it up so that I could observe two plants that were in my garden and also several birds that I have been witnessing in my yard. And so these were the plants and animals that I said that I'm going to track and I can go in and whenever I make an observation, I can either print out a piece of paper and go sit outside and um, mark what I've seen, what I've heard for the birds. And then I go on the website and enter in the data. And it's not letting me open the data website, but it's very straightforward and simple. It just shows you or asks you questions about, you know, were you, were you sitting, here it is, did you sit to observe? Did you um, did you how much how much time did you spend? What did you see? Um, so it's very straightforward. Nothing scary. Very um, very easy to navigate and to use. So I just wanted to share that website with you, just because we're so excited at the CBC that we're going to become a part of this project in the future. Um, and then if you're not a bird person, if you're not a tree or flower person, there are lots of other um, programs out there for you um, to get involved in if you'd like. So this is one that's called Frog Watch USA. Um, this is all across the United States. Um, people go out during breeding season. Um, they listen to um, the bird or the bird, listen to me, the frog calls, and then they provide data on what they've heard for frog, different frogs in their areas. Um, one thing that's really nice about citizen science is um, very talented scientists have sat down and they have come up with training modules to make sure that the casual citizen has the tools that they need in order to become um, good citizen scientists. So here on Frog Watch, you can see that there's a volunteer training that you can watch that explains all about 
the different types of frogs and toads that you might find in your community. Um, and then there's another training module that talks about how you actually enter in your data to make sure that it's done in the same format as everyone else is doing this across the country. Um, so if you're interested in frogs and toads, this is a very uh, fun one to get involved in. Um, one last one that I do want to mention because it is very interesting is Journey North. Um, I first heard about Journey North because of the monarch butterflies. And I knew a lot of schools used this project to track the monarchs as they were um, traveling north in the spring and then when they were traveling to their overwintering sites in the fall. But when I started to do more research about Journey North, I found out that they are tracking all different types of migration. You can get involved. Um, you, what's on the screen now are just a sampling of some of the projects that they are doing and that are available for citizen scientists. And so I was pretty excited to look at the hummingbird one. Um, I come from a family that loves to watch our hummingbirds. And the nice thing about Journey North is not only are you, you observing and inputting data, but, oops, I went to the wrong place. You are also available, it is available for you to view the data. So if I can get this to open you will see how far north our citizen scientists have tracked the hummingbirds so far in their spring migration, which is just fun to see because if you are here in New York State, if you're watching this locally, they are close to us. So if you look at this data and you're interested in hummingbirds, you know now is when you should be putting out your feeder to get ready for our little friends that are showing up. So as you can see, it shows you the date, the timeline, and it shows where people have observed them as they have migrated north. And um, there we go. I think we have one dot near the Catskills that has showed a sighting um, on the 28th. That was yesterday. So it's a lot of fun to check this out, to help um, observe and to share information. And um, I got excited about this one and I hope everyone listening finds a project that they get in, uh, very excited about too. All right, I'm gonna turn it back over to Olivia. I think she had another um, citizen science app that she wanted to share. All right, so when you first log into eBird, um, it asks you to review your preferences. Uh, so you can choose to have common name listed, a scientific name, both um, when you're searching for the birds that you've spotted. Um, what's really great about this is uh, it will, you can either tell it what location you're in when you're recording data, um, or it'll pick up on your location. So it will say, I think you might be in the Catskill Forest Preserve, and you can say, yes, I am. Um, and uh, then let me just, uh, okay, and you can allow it to use your location. Um, so, let's see. Let's see. And so you can either record a checklist of the species that you found um, live uh, right while you're doing your walk, or you can do it after the fact. Um, what's nice about doing it live is that you're more likely to remember exactly what you saw. Um, but if you write it down and then record it afterwards, that's another good way to do it. Uh, so we can start a checklist right now. And um, then you basically just look for what species that you found. So um, I can type in um, that I saw a wood duck and um, it'll ask you how many you saw. So I can say I saw five wood duck and then hit done. Um, and then as you keep walking or keep traveling, um, you can put in what other species that you found. Uh, and it does actually um, put species right at the top of the list um, that it thinks you might encounter based on your location. So if you're near a wetland, um, it might give you a lot of uh, like um, 
waterfowl species, um, which can be helpful if uh, you're trying to figure out what, what species are around where you are. Um, and uh, going into location, um, if you do this after the fact, you can search for a location. So if you happen to be at the Catskills Visitor Center, you can see. Um, normally it would, it would do this. I, I think maybe it has to do with recent versus nearby. Um, so if you're on the app, uh, it'll basically just show you, you know, your personal lists. Um, I also really like just going on the eBird website because then you can go to a location um, and you can actually uh, see what other people have been recording, which can be really interesting. Um, so for example, last year, uh, the John Burroughs uh, Natural History Society, they did uh, something called a big sit at the Catskills Visitor Center. Um, and they recorded over 25 species uh, of, of birds over the course of 12 hours of being at the visitor center. Um, John Burroughs Natural History Society is a great local Ulster County resource. Uh, if you want to go on um, a bird program, a bird virtual bird program or a bird walk. Um, and they also have fantastic links to um, places to bird right in Ulster County. Uh, so when you're done with your list, um, you hit stop, stop your track, and then you put in more specific information like how many observers, how many minutes were you traveling, is this a complete checklist of the birds that you were able to identify, um, and then you hit submit. Um, I'm not going to hit submit because I've never actually seen wood duck at the Catskills Visitor Center before, uh, so I don't want to affect our citizen science data here. Um, but. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an overview, that's how it works. Great app, I enjoy it a lot. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Let me close the stop sh close screen share here. Um. All right, well, I'm gonna switch over and show you one of those big databases um, that I was talking about in our, <clears throat> excuse me, in our um, list of resources that we'll post online. Um, by tomorrow. And I'm going to take you to the first one, which is the National Geographic Citizen Science Database. And I uh, had so much fun on this website when I found it that I was actually late for a meeting. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy it as much. Um, the fun thing about this is, once again, it has citizen science projects that have to do with everything. Um, you know, night sky brightness, um, I love this one, Search Space. So this was a project where in 2004, a satellite went through the tail of a comet and it had panels, um, gel panels. And so it collected um, space dust that came from this comet. And now they are asking citizen scientists to sign up, get trained, and then help them identify where on these gel plates there's actually a material and so you sign up, you get trained, and then you look at digital images of the gel and you mark off where you think you see dust so that the scientists know where to go to extract these pieces so that they can then study them. I mean, how more, oh, that's just so exciting to me because you're, you are involved with actual real science. Yeah, I'm a geek and I just find that amazing. Um, one of the other, projects I saw in here that just sounded like a lot of fun to me. Um, and that I think with social distancing is probably an interesting one to think about is if you live um, near a place where you can go hiking to a top of a mountain, they're looking for citizen scientists to take photographs from mountaintops. And then scientists are using these photographs to study air quality and haze pollution, um, which to me is a lot of fun and is something that you can do uh, 
you know, right now um, and have a reason to go outside and, and go for a nice walk. Um, the interesting, interesting thing about this site is they also list a couple of programs that we'd already talked about, like the Frog, Frog Watch. And then there's a North American Amphibia, Amphibian Monitoring Program. Um, and so they have a wide range of fun tasks on this that they just need people to help so that they can complete their, their science research. Um, there's even one on here about looking at photos from uh, the shape of the galaxy. So it's pretty interesting. Um, and uh, so we'll list some of these that we can go find that these different projects. Um, we've also included the um, actual projects that we talked about today and then some some that we haven't, things like Budburst, which is similar to the phenology um, website. Um, there's the DEC water assessment by volunteer evaluators, which I did mention in passing, where you go out and you take stream samples and look at your stream and collect data to help determine whether it's a healthy stream or not. Um, there's also the list of application help with identification. Um, and as we find other things, we'll add them in. This way, you to hopefully browse and find an interesting project for yourself or for someone else to become a citizen scientist. Anything you want to add to that, Olivia? Um, well, we'll definitely be continuing to add to this list. And um, it, when, you, when you get a chance to look at it, click through definitely the, like Katie was saying, these databases, because they just have a fantastic number of citizen science projects that you can get involved in. Um, I searched on uh, the um, SciStarter.org uh, citizen science database and you can punch in like your location so you can write in Catskills or you can um, write in your county and it'll come up with projects that are specific for where you live. Um, so one that popped up when I typed in Catskills uh, was the New York Phenology Project like we were talking about earlier and also um, IMAP Invasives which uh, is an app where you can log in um, where, where you're seeing invasive species, um, which can also be a really helpful um, piece of information for people who work in that field um, so that they can monitor invasives before they become um, an, an issue. So uh, really, really great websites that are available to us. Um, so uh, we, we are in not complete experts in citizen science, but if you have any questions for us that we can try to answer, um, there's a chat box. Feel free to put those in the chat box and we can answer them. Um, or if you would like, we, um, you can email either of us at info, and I'll put this in the chat box, um, info at catskillcenter.org and um, Olivia and I We'll get back to you if you have any questions. And there's the there's the email in the chat box. Um, but if you have any questions, let us know. We're happy to try and answer them. If you find a project that you really enjoy and you want to share it, we'd love to hear about that too. Um, totally. Give you a couple minutes to see if you have any questions, because I know if you're like me, it's not the fastest typer in the world. <laughs> Same. So it sounds like, Olivia, you've done a lot with eBird and you've done a lot of bird checklists. Do you, do they also have the application where you can um, uh, actually hear the bird song and try and compare the bird song with what you're hearing in the wild. Is that part of the eBird? No, that's a Audubon. different um, Audubon. Okay. Yeah, Audubon is great for that. Uh, and it, you, I don't think you can't record the bird call that you're listening to with Audubon. There might be a, a, a bird app that allows you to do that. Um, but if you uh, if you go through a few different species that you think it might be um, based on habitat that you're in or um, like uh, color or size and shape of the bird that you're looking at, um, I will go through and play a few calls out in the field to compare to what I'm listening to. Um, uh, it works 
pretty well. Like, like Katie said, I mean, I'm not a, a complete expert. I'm definitely an, a, still an a intermediate uh, citizen scientist. Um, but uh, it did help for the most part identify something last week, just playing some bird calls of what I thought that something was. Um, so, uh, so Audubon is a great resource for that. Mm -hmm. The fun thing about citizen science um, is it's for all ages. Um, a lot of the websites that I visited had um, specific resources for teachers or educators so that they could do citizen science work in their classrooms. Um, but it, it's, you know, limitless on what the ages they accept as a citizen scientist. And so if you have kids or grandkids that you want to get involved, this is a great way to do it. Um, I know I've taken my girls outside with a book that we have that actually makes the bird calls to see if we can get any birds to answer us in, in the breeding season, which probably isn't the nicest thing. But um, so my girls have started actually picking up on some of the bird songs, which is a lot of fun. And then we plug them into our bird list. So that's been really, that's really wonderful. Fun. So it doesn't look like we have any questions, um, but Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, thank you I know I enjoyed, much. yeah, enjoyed getting ready for this. And um, good luck with any citizen science projects you decide to take on. And once we get our phenology trail up and running, we'll make sure we let everybody know. And we hope you'll come and visit us and do a little citizen science work on our property. So, so thank you. And um, we will hopefully see you at a fro pl program in the future. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thank you. Bye.